a lot of football players came out of down. It, it's a crazy, it's such a small community. Uh, Essentially Catholic was tiny high school. Um, um, and then DHS, Donaldsonville High, was, uh, you know, a small high school. You know, the Thomas brothers, Alvin Thomas, yeah. Um, yeah. Donald Ray Thomas, who played with me at Tulane. Um, and I could go down the list. There's a, if you look through the Wikipedia of Donaldsonville now, a bunch of guys played in the NFL. That's right. Know. Starting way before our time, Alexander um, uh, played for the Baltimore Colts. He played for the, for the pros. It, it, it was a disproportionate number of athletes from that, that era. It's absolutely true. But, you know, a lot of it had to do with just a commitment to athletics. Um, I don't know if you know this, but because of one of your cousins, um, another Sotil, who for basically free built the baseball program, you know, oh, that, Frank. Yeah, Frank Sotil, who was married to my cousin, my aunt. Um, you know, that that's how we're related to the Sotil family. Yeah. Through yeah. For marriage. And um that that whole thing, a lot of guys made it to the show, made it to the pros. Um uh Jacques Alexander was, you know, who had, you know, <laughs> Nolan Ryan on his wall when he was a, a kid. Yeah, that's that's the Alexander family, right? His uncle yeah. was a was a, a pro football player, right? That, exactly. That, that's exactly his uncle and his dad uh, was a big influence in my life. And these guys were coaches at DHS. They always wanted me to go to DHS, and my parents said no. You know, he's going to stay. Yeah. Now I was begging. I, I wanted to play for CJ Alexander in the worst way. Yeah, that's who yeah. it was, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, I just couldn't do it, and. um but yeah, his nephew, Jacques Alexander, ended up in the same bullpen with the famous Nolan Ryan. I mean, a lot that, of yeah. guys got baseball scholarships and, you know, made it to Division Two and Division Three in the pros and all out of Donaldsonville because that baseball park was what it was. Right? Yep. Um, and you're right. That's uh, my, our, my cousin, Frank Sotio. I mean, he was my dad's age, but he was so devoted, man. He just spent his life promoting, you know, from Little League through Babe Ruth uh, through, uh, uh, baseball. And he, ju he just was a community service-oriented guy. Good for him. You know, he passed away a couple of years ago and really got honored for, for that lifetime of work. Yeah, th those are the real heroes. And right before the show cranked up, the first name that came up when you and I started talking was um, my hero, Joe Bonadonna. And yeah, you mine too. Joe Bonadonna got me lifting weights and working out and taking care of yourself. You know, he would influence. And, and listen, so here's a guy who took an interest, kind of selectively took an interest in certain kids, I think, looking back on it, that were high potential athletes. Now, I emphasize to anybody who's got any, any cynicism, this was no prurient interest. He wasn't weird in any way. It wasn't untoward. It was, he was a coach of, uh, he was a lifetime athlete and he was a coach uh, mentality person. That wasn't his job to be a coach, but boy, he was generous about his, his incredible gym that he put together uh, in a shed in his backyard originally. And he would give keys to the shed to selective ones of us to go work out, but he had a huge influence on my life. He truly did. And yours too, I know. Yeah. And you, you mentioned, um, Lou Latino. Um, and by the way, Lou Latino's name is in my book. Um, ah. you know, as a matter of fact, when I was writing the book, um, I, I wrote all the notes myself and I got together with a writer friend of mine so we can make the chapters make sense. So this guy, Dean Laurie, who's well known in television circles, the guy's written, won awards for everything. And, you know, we're reading through my notes one day and he goes, wait a minute. You literally know a guy named Lou Latino? <laughs> he goes, that's his real name. It, because writers, TV writers look for those kind of names. He goes, we can't make up something this good. Lou Latino <laughs> is spelled just like Latino. Yeah, yeah. I'm related to most of the Latinos. I'm not related yeah. to Lou, but, you know, um, all the Italians are related down there somehow. Yeah, we're all related to each other. That's and then we keep reading along, and then he stops again. He goes, why? Wait, hang on. Meatball Bonadonna? <laughs> There's well, a guy exactly. named Meatball <laughs> Bonadonna. What's his real name? I said, I think it's Tony, but it, it's me. We don't know the name. I gave the, the Chamber of Commerce at Downsville invited me to come back and, and give a talk, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago. And 
I wish I could remember the, the bit I did, but it was all the nicknames. We grew up with Pookie, Zookie, Nookie, Lala, Sasa, oh, and, and then it, it continued. I don't know, any, and, you know, Joe Bonadonna's wife was Joe, was Margaret Teapot Bonadonna. Everybody yeah. had a nickname. There are six Vincent Sotils in Donaldsonville. Because yeah. guess what my great-grandfather's name was, Vincenzo. Everybody had a had a nickname. Your daddy, Vincent Cy Tartaritz, right? Yeah. And on and on and on. They all had nicknames. It's just a colorful, colorful community. It really is. No one goes by their real name. And we used to do that <laughs> on the early days of this show, folks. If you go back 2,300 episodes, Anna Vocino and I used to just talk about the different names. And every weekend, I would bring in a few more names. And then people <laughs> from Donaldsonville. Um, right, here, let, let me give you a test. I'm going to let you drink your coffee so you don't spit it when I say this. Do you know what Tatoon's real name was? Yeah, no, I don't know Tatoon. I don't know any of their real names. Tatoon's real name was Mildred. You see, I didn't know that Tatoon. I knew what Tatoon was. I only know that because my mom taught her. <laughs> Think about it. You, you wife Tatoon, walk down the street every day, and everybody go, look, that's Tatoon. That's hey, Tatoon. Tatoon. That's she right. just... All she did her whole life, she 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 had some kind of learning disability or something. She walked down the street, and people, went, hey, it's a tune, and she would wave back. And you wave back, but it wasn't just people who had disability. It was that look. Here comes Mitch Big Head Randazzo because he had a big head. Well, there's Frank Taterize Sotil because he had big eyes. There's Frank Rake Sotil because his front teeth raked out and on and on and on. It sounds like, you know, a Martin Scorsese movie or something. They nicknames. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a weird story. Um, you know, Tate died early. Taterize. And, and by the way, folks, yeah. people call this guy Taterize. Oh, you know, now <laughs> today, you, 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 if you call someone by the wrong pronouns, you're, you're, you're screwed in life. That's right. Everybody had a name in Donaldsville. So Taterize, um, um, you know, died young. He died pretty yeah, he young, did. right? He did. Um, they Sweet were dredging. Much. They were dredging the bayou out, and um, you know they have to dredge that bayou right in that area every so many years. Yeah, yeah, it gets full of mud. So Tater lost his um, his driver's license at one time. Of course, these things are made of plastic. They found it in that in that river silt that's in the bayou. They found <laughs> Tater eyes. Yeah, <laughs> can you imagine? It's like, well, oh, he's dead, but we found your license, Tate. Yeah. Uh, uh, Frank Latino, uh, you know, Frank, he, he had, yeah. Latino. they call him legs. I know. I mean, it's, it, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't it was malicious. <laughs> no, just craziness. It's crazy. No, everybody had a nickname. Um, do you know FL's real name? I always knew him as FL. I uh, have no idea. FL, see, what is it? I don't know. I just no, know. I don't know. His last name was FL Trepanya. Yeah, FL FL Trepanya. And the guy. FL would jump in your car. He loved to go to two lane football games. And if you stopped at a stop, he would just jump in your car, get in your car to, I want to ride horse. He called everybody a horse. I want to ride horse and take him to New Orleans. And he never, here's the deal. He, the guy had some sort of affliction where some sort of nervous thing, he would start walking and he would get faster and faster. And he couldn't stop. He right. couldn't stop. And if you right. tell this to people, if you try to put this in a movie, they would go, that character won't work because it, we don't believe this. Uh, Frank DeNino hated him because um, uh, FL used to always come on to his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank DeNino would kick him out of the barbershop. Oh, my God. And, and I don't know if you remember this. You go into Frank DeNino's barbershop. There was a turtle that would just walk around on the floor. Of and course was, I remember. The turtle got bigger and bigger. He also, Frank DeNino had dirty magazines in the back in the bathroom. Yeah, everybody had to go to the bathroom. All those teenagers. <laughs> then he'd pound on the door. Get out of there. I know what you're doing. <laughs> my other favorite is, um, speaking of names, uh, you go to the other barbershop. What was that guy's name? Do you remember? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Now, Mr. Paul Email. No. Is no. that the one you're talking about? I'm talking about Muffler Jim Brony. Muffler. Oh, Muffler Jim Brony. That's the third barbershop. <laughs> <laughs> Muffler. And his, his son was a few years younger than me. You know what they called his son? What? Tailpipe. 
<laughs> your dad's name is Muffler. They're going to call you Tailpipe. I this mean, is all true, folks. I've forgotten this, but this is all one thousand. And this could go on and on and on and on and on. Yeah. I mean, it's just um, <laughs> people ask me a lot of times, how can you, because I, I make my living as a speaker primarily, oh, you're a great storyteller. I say, everybody I grew up with can tell stories. All the, the men, the women, everybody's, it's a storytelling culture, man. You know, we we were blessed to grow up that like you, Benny. I mean, we were blessed to grow up in that culture. I think you're right. Um, you know, people say, well, "Geez, 2,300 podcasts. How do you, how do you keep talking?" It's like I grew up on my grandfather's front porch. Yeah. Every every afternoon, Vic Profita came over, and um, they would just start yapping, and the yapping never stopped. Well, and your dad, your dad's a great storyteller. I mean, oh I used to to ride the music jobs with me. We talk nonstop about everything under the sun. You know, I mean, it's just true. It's just a great culture again, a great, a great uh, heritage to, to, to have come from and to continue. Wayne, you, all right, you started off at LSU. You get you get out of a Central Catholic. By the time, I, like you became a hero to me as a kid because. You, you were swinging an axe in a band, even though it was a, a band that was playing weddings. You you were swinging that. Your brother, your brother had hippie long hair, Glenn. He yeah, he did. That's long. right. He actually married a flower child named Linda at one time. Oh my and, God, I can't believe you remember that. That's I, right. I, I, you, my mom says, I, I, you don't know this about me, Wayne, but I, I have, I can't forget anything, unfortunately. And I'll never forget that period of the band. Um, was when the music changed for a while because Linda was playing everything from she was able to sing she had a voice she could sing like John, people would stop dancing to hear I mean this woman could sing her name is Linda Hayes and in fact Glenn and his wife Jeannie went to London uh, in recent years and went visit Linda and uh, yeah and yeah it was just very gracious but she had a voice that would stop the dancing and she could she sounded just like Janis Joplin when we used to play me and my me and Bobby McGee in those kinds of songs. Boy, she could belt it. Yeah, Linda Hayes was her name. Yeah, Linda would, and you're gonna you're gonna be shocked when I say this, but not only could she sound like Janis Joplin, who's one of my favorites. I, I you know before I walk on stage, I, I'm, I'm gonna give a little secret. I can't walk on stage without putting earplugs in and listening to Janis Joplin. It it, it, oh, it, it it picks me up and I go, you know what? We came from the same fucking neighborhood. There's a thousand people out there. I can do this. Good for um, you, man. Um, but she would also do a Carol King. She would do a Janis Joplin. Oh, and yes. I could do a Carol King, something from She Palestine. would do the Carol King. Like, Carol King was hot then. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to do. I used to love playing when she sang, man. Oh, my God. She was something. Yeah, well, look, anything was better than my dad being the singer. I mean, <laughs> that's what they had. They they had Cy Tauterich singing. Here's the, the thing. Your dad, we used to love watching your dad because your dad sang earnestly. He would close his eyes. He would be singing uh, Georgia on my mind, and he, he was thinking he was Ray Charles singing it. Oh, yeah. And then he would close it. And, you know, it said something about she, do it congruently, man. You sell it. You don't have to hit every note, but just be passionate about it. And there's a, a great message in that, I think. What do you mean every note? I don't think he ever hit a note. <laughs> but, but, you know, they they did it and people loved it, you know, and, and it would yeah. just go on and on and on. But I, and when I was thinking about Wayne today, I, went, I wonder what I had. So Linda Hayes, she, where was she from? What, well, she was from Chicago, and she knew the Giots for some reason. They came, and she came down one summer. She, I mean, she was nineteen. Glenn was twenty or something. They got married. They stayed married a year or so. You know, they're just kids. Yeah. And it had a very kind of harmonious ending of that marriage. And then, I mean, it, it says something about both of them. So as grown up people, uh, Glenn and Jeannie reached out, and and no, uh, and it was got you know. It was a sweet reunion that I'm sorry, we were just kids then, man. We just yeah. happened to get married for a little while. And then uh, and then Glenn married Jeannie Fox, and they've been married for 50 years now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like some of these women, you know, my, my cousin, Glenn Tauterich, uh, who's a couple of years younger than you, I think. Yeah, um, I remember Glenn. Glenn dated and married a woman named Julie Cruz, who I thought was the most beautiful girl when I was a kid. Oh, she was beautiful. I remember her, too. By the way, she kept it together. I really? A couple of years. I wonder what ever happened to Judy. Because I was visiting with Glenn, and uh, Glenn's got this beautiful, 
Glenn ended up in a good place. Kelly, uh, he and Kelly live together and, and do this whole thing. I love Kelly to death. Whatever happened to Julie? She was living somewhere out in the Midwest and doing fine. Yeah, do. yeah so I, I'm always interested in these people. It's like, whatever happened to? But when yeah, you talk yeah. about whatever happened to Wayne Sotil, you you played music, you went to LSU, um, yeah. you worked in your father's firecracker stands. Um, <laughs> That's absolutely right. And you become this guy. Now, I told your sister, uh, Tony, this story a few years ago, and it, it brought her to tears. Um, your dad, so I ended up working in a firecracker stand. You you were all already in med school or doing whatever in the hell yeah. you were going to do. And Stephen was running the operation now. And it was down to one stand. Yeah, and, Stephen, the younger brother. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, who, who's also a doctor, folks. This yeah, whole family a, is he's like He's a physician, a, right. Yeah. yeah, this is a ridiculous family. They, they're all like overachievers to an nth degree. And we're going to hear about Wayne's daughters here in a minute because they're running the Sotil Center for Resilience. Yeah. The whole thing is just crazy. But going back to his firecracker stands, Stephen was running it. He needed help. I was 14. I go in, I start helping Stephen. Stephen gets into med school and he's not going to do it anymore. So I go to your dad and I said, uh, Mr. Mitch, um, are you going to he goes no I'm, I'm done and i said can i have the stand and he goes what are you going to do with it i said well i'm going to park it at my uncle frank and i'm going to i'm going to keep doing it and he goes well you can't do that you 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 don't have any credit you don't know anyone i said well where do you get the fireworks from he goes baton rouge as his wholesaler and i've been dealing and i said well you know i learned everything about the business i want to do this and uh, he said, I tell you what, I will give you not give your dad never gave anybody anything except meatballs. Um, <laughs> he goes, I will give you all the fireworks I have left. And then you can pay me when you get the money back. Because he didn't think I was going to succeed. So he had some straggling fireworks. And he gave me all of that. Yeah. He, he wrote everything down, he came up with a list. And he goes, Okay, go, go sell those. Let's see. I came back in two days. I had the cash. I paid him what he wanted. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Mitch, I need some more fireworks. He goes, get in the car. He brings me to Baton Rouge. He introduces me to the guy. He goes, give him whatever he wants. I'm signing off on this. I'm a darn Joe Atoll. That's who he used to buy. Him. That, that's exactly who it is. Yeah. I'm signing off on this, give him what he needs. And I, I learned how to keep books and how to do a business based on that. And uh, I kept that running. As a matter of fact, I went and found another one of his old stands because some of my younger brothers were coming up. So I had two stands yeah. on each end of town and ran that. The same thing. Vinny, I, I saw fireworks. And for the listeners, in South Louisiana, the fireworks season is the Christmas season, culminating in New Year's Eve with bonfires on the levee. And I saw fireworks... Every I, I live in North Carolina now, and, and our family joke is every time it's cold and rainy during the Christmas season, uh, Dad feels like he ought to go sit in the tin shed and freeze his ass off because that's how I spend every Christmas. Lou Latino and Lou Fry were yeah. my two best friends from first through 12th grade. And the year I was getting my PhD that May, I went home to Donaldsonville over Christmas and I was selling fireworks and they would come by the stand and say, what the hell you getting ready to get your PhD in clinical psychology, you're still selling fireworks. I said, I'm never going to make more money per hour than, <laughs> than I'll make in this fireworks thing. Cause the markup is 2000%. <laughs> so I put myself through school. My dad would have us all work in the fireworks stand as well as his various business. We learned how to work, man. And you did too. I yeah. mean, your dad was always a hustler. He had all kinds of businesses. And so you learn how to work. You learn how to show up and be nice to people and uh, work hard. That plus athletics, it was a good, good shaping uh, environment. It becomes a winning combination. And when I tell that to people, you know, a lot of times, and, and this is going to meander nicely into what we're talking about here, people will say to me, well, Vinny, you got lucky. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, where did this luck begin? Was it, when the nuns were, was it when the nuns were beating the crap out of me? <laughs> when I was getting teased for having the world's worst speech impediment? When did this luck in my yeah. life happen? Because I don't remember being lucky. 
I just remember working my ass off towards a goal. Um, and still today, um, I work towards goals. And they don't have to be money goals. Um, I just finished building a, um, a Cedar Strip kayak. It took me 14 months. It took me 320 hours. And I knew nothing about woodwork. Uh, so I go to this guy who knew how to do this, um, uh, Joey shot at Turning Point Boatworks. And I said, Joey, what would it take for me to come in the shop and you teach me how to do this? And um, he said, come on in. We'll do And He never lets people in. He was a fan of the show. He was a fan of what I talk about. He says, come on. Every Saturday, 42 Saturdays, I, I drove to Richmond, Virginia. I live in Charlottesville. I drove that hundred some odd miles. Eight hours, sat in that shop, learned everything there is about building a boat. On April 1st, I finished that boat 14 months later and, yeah. um, and took it out the next day for a paddle. Everything in life is building that boat and then getting to take it out for a paddle, right? Yes. Yeah, it, it doesn't you. matter what it is. Right? You got lucky. It floated, right? <laughs> I, was got lucky. I was worried. It's like... Yeah. That thing might sink. No, listen, I'm, I'm teasing my Uncle Charlie. I remember my Uncle Charlie saying to me when I was in college, look, you want to be successful? Here's the thing. Go work your ass off uh, doing something for about 25 years. You're going to make something of yourself. And then people are going to say, look at that guy. He sure got lucky. And yeah. I swear, people do say that. And, yeah, I've, I want to do what you do. How do you know? How could you got lucky? How, did you, how, how can you do what you And I, I try not to be an old fart about it, but there is no shortcut, whether it's fitness or marriage, health or career thriving, there are no shortcuts, man. Give up the fantasy that you're going to win the lottery and figure out uh, who you are, what your talents are, what your passions are, what your goals are, uh, figure out what the barriers are, figure out how to scale them and get to work and keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. You get there. I know you believe in that philosophy. You epitomize that philosophy. Yeah, but how, how did Wayne Sotio figure? Look, you, you're going through psychology. You're at LSU. You're you're getting yeah. your undergrad. You're going into med school. You you, you become a um, psychologist. Well, here's the thing. I was a I was a I was in pre med, and I ran into my my old chemistry teacher from high school who went back to LSU to get his PhD. Brother Godfrey, I never forget. He was a peculiar guy, and he said, "Sotio, what you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm in pre med, brother. I'm not loving it. I'm making good grades." He said, "You." you ought to be a psychologist boy you've been a psychologist all your life and it's like oh my god you're right i switched to psychology and it was like coming home so then i finished lsu and i um i got a, a fellowship to go to graduate school at the university of south carolina i got my phd in clinical psychology from there and then i finished my training at duke in, in the department of psychiatry in uh medical psychology and so then my career got launched as a clinical and health psychologist. I joined the faculty at medical school at Wake Forest in Winston-Salem. And this relates to you in your background in exercise physiology, Vinny. When I was on the faculty <laughs> right after the Civil War, I'm not that old, but I'm a, when I, my first job, we invented the field of cardiac rehabilitation, as, as it is now known, multidisciplinary rehabilitation of heart patients. An exercise physiologist, nurses, cardiologists, vocational nutritional experts, and a behavioral health expert. And that, that was me. And we became a model uh, for, for cardiac rehab worldwide. That's when I started studying resilience. Who are the people who get through hard times and come out stronger having gone through those hard times? Like you with leukemia. It was a you came out stronger. You didn't just endure and go back to baseline. That's what resilience is about. I first started studying that with heart patients. And then we stumbled into the super specialty of physicians coming to for us for counseling. So uh, we've we had 40,000 people come through our practice over the years and about 13,000 have been physicians and other high performers. So we developed models for how do these extraordinarily high performing people think? How do they cope with change? How do they manage themselves, uh, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually? How do they manage family, work, life juggling? And that's that's what my career has has been about over these past 45 years. Is it safe to say that medical <clears throat> physicians are, are just overworked? 
pretty much. I mean, the, these guys, they go through college, and it's all rush, rush, rush. As a matter of fact, I'm always, you know, I, every Friday show, I have some medical doctor on and they all say the same thing. I'll say, why didn't you guys study nutrition in college, for, for example, and they'll say, because we we're too busy trying to learn everything else. That's absolutely right. The amount of information they've got to learn. We listen, this is interesting. I was at Tulane lecturing uh, to the, the Department of Orthopedic Surgery one year. And the chair at the time was Dr. Rodriguez, who was a delightful guy. And he was 20 his years son old. Went, his son uh, played uh, football with me and became a rowing champion in the 84. Yeah. No, no, that was uh, no, maybe the, no, not 84 Olympics. Uh, maybe the one Raul Rodriguez. Is his son. Raul. Well, yeah. well, in, well, Dr. Rodriguez, we were teasing about the new residents had just come on. In one of the, we were talking about generational stuff. And Dr. Rodriguez said, I, to you, in, I said, different generations use language differently. They don't mean to be disrespectful. They just use, and he, Dr. Rodriguez said, to your point, the new residents just came. One of them called me dude yesterday. Right. You know, you would never do it. So, but here's his point. It's such a misnomer to think these young people are lazy. He said, when I became an orthopedic surgeon, I had to learn everything in this book. And he held up a big textbook. And this was the Bible of orthopedics. My residents have to learn everything on that shelf. And most of them are CD-ROMs at the time. Right. The amount of information these physicians have to learn is astronomical in every realm. But the, the length of medical education stays the same. So furthermore, we've studied this, uh, Vinny, that six-fold more physicians work 60-plus hours a week than any other profession we've studied. 22% work 80-plus hours a week. Wow. It's just trying to keep up with what they've got to keep up with. So uh, I remember there was a famous study uh, about 20 years ago. If physicians spent time doing everything we we're saying you should be doing to promote wellness— it would constitute an extra four hours a day in their work. They can't do it all. They need to have teams of people that are hired and empowered to teach about nutrition, to teach about exercise, to teach about mind-body health. Uh, so, no, physicians can't. The answer to your question is yes. Literally, they're overworked and understaffed. Yeah, you know, and one of the things that I talk to these doctors all the time, and I tell people, look, you know, we think, doc, you know, our my parents generation, they look at doctors as being God, godlike. Right. And right. I always explain to them, listen, these people are human, and they make mistakes. And you have to advocate for yourself. And you have to ask questions or, or otherwise, you're going to be screwed. Yeah. Um, you know, people say to me all the time, they'll say, Well, why does not my doctor know this, that and the other thing It's like, because they don't have time to learn, especially when you belong to some of these big organizations um, that you know, pull all these doctors in that, that say, okay, Here's what you do. We'll pay you malpractice. We'll take care of you, but you know, status quo. So if you get blood, for instance, if you get blood work back, um, the doctor just looks down the blood work and they want to make sure that you stay between two numbers. That means you're normal, right? right. They don't have time to to look at every patient. And what exactly. And what your experience is, where your blood work was last time, where it is now. The other thing, Vinny, you know, back when... <clears throat> Let's go back to the cardiac rehab world. So 45 years ago, um, cardiologists knew about as much about exercise as um, PE teachers did. Right. Cardiologists knew about as much about medication as pharmacists did. But what has happened in the last 40 years is everybody's raised their game, the raised, deepened their science. No one of us can be nearly as good as more of us can be if we're working effectively together. So no physician will ever know as much about medications as a clinical pharmacist does. No physician is ever going to know as much about exercise physiology as an exercise physiologist does, or a nutritionist, and on and on and on. So the, the physicians know a whole bunch about whatever their medical specialty is. It's incumbent upon us to take responsibility to access the expertise of other professionals who know a whole bunch about aspects of well-being that are important to us, be it nutrition, psychology, exercise, physiology. And I think that's one of your messages and it's a great message. Well, yeah, I, I think one of the problems some doctors fall into, and not all doctors, is that, 
they they will dig their heels in on something. And, um, you know, it's like, hey, this is what I learned. This is what I'm sticking with. And of course, these doctors have to do all of this continuing education. I'll give you an example. I was at a dinner party. It was about a year ago. And I, was, I won't say that the, the hospital because I would be naming the guy, but this guy was the head of cardiologist at, at a certain big hospital. And um, he was talking, we, we got into a conversation. I hate having this conversation. I hate talking shop when I'm at a dinner party, but he brought it up and he knew who, who I was and all these doctors I've had on the show. And he said, well, you know, obviously uh, saturated fat causes heart disease. And I said, based on what? Because the study that showed that if you actually go past the abstract and read the study is exactly the opposite. Right. And he said to me, he goes, so you don't think that saturated fat causes heart disease? I said, absolutely not. And, and by the way, this isn't my feeling. I just read the same study you read, except I didn't read the abstract. I read the study. And um, I gave him places to go to read the whole study. And he just kept on and on. He goes, well, what do you think about cholesterol? I said, well, it's a fat lipid that we need to survive. Every every cell in your body uses cholesterol to to make it to, to heal it, to make it better. And he says, but you don't think it has anything to do with heart disease? I said, well, it does. It tries to mend the problem. And he goes, well, that's just crazy. And I said, well, Doc, let, let's let's go with that for a second. And uh, I said, are you a plumber or an electrician in the heart <laughs> profession? He goes, I'm a plumber. You know, electricians, you know, will do ablations and all this. And but the plumbers go and they clear out arteries. I said, right. so you're a plumber. Yeah. What do you do? He goes, I, I take plaque out of the artery. You know, we, we either drill it out or we balloon it out or we have to go in and do whatever, resection. I said, Great. Um, so you, you admit you're pulling plaque out of the artery? Yeah. Where does the plaque come from? Inflammation, stress, this, that, and the other thing. I said. I didn't hear you say cholesterol yet. <laughs> you know, and he goes, well, cholesterol comes in at the end. You know, and I said, okay, well, small dense particles, maybe APO A, APO B. I mean, we can have that discussion. And then he was shocked that I, I could go down that, that protein road with him on, on what's in this fat lipid. And he goes, well, no, well, cholesterol is there at the end. I said, so every time a house burns down, and you see a bunch of firemen wrapping up their hoses, you're going to conclude that, oh, wait, every time I see firemen, I see a burnt house. Therefore, firemen causes the house to burn. <laughs> and, you know, and when you put it to him like that, you know, you give him food for thought. But then he's going to walk away from that party and say, you know what, screw it. I'm not going to pay attention to a PE teacher. I'm going to go back and do what I'm doing. Yeah, right. right? So <laughs> there, there's that weird disconnect where some doctors have come on board with this and other doctors are just digging in. And that's just one example. I could go through a thousand examples of that. Yeah. Yeah. What say you? We, do it, we do it the way we do it because we've always done it this way, as opposed right. to we need to really re rethink this. And, uh, you know, let's not even get started on sugar in the whole uh, sugar industry and in, in, in lobby in the power of uh, the, the science and in, in what a culprit that is. I will tell you a funny story. A world famous electro, uh, uh, a world famous uh, exercise physiologist, I know, and I were invited to go to Australia to lecture at a series of cardiology conferences. And this guy is a sweet guy, and he said to me, "Listen, he's known me a lot of years." He said, "Listen, you know, we'll be in another country, and they may not understand your sense of humor when you tell all these Cajun jokes and all this crazy shit you talk about." And so you got to be culturally respectful. Well. One of my friends, Sticks, was at my hospital, we do so many cleaning out artery invasive procedures. Pretty soon, we're going to have the, you remember the Rotor Rooter truck? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have a Rotor Rooter truck just going around Rotor Rooter and everybody's coronary orders. And he would tell this joke. We, we were in, in, uh, in Brisbane, in Australia, and nobody laughed. And then we went to Sydney and he told the joke again, we have a rotor rooter truck and he shows rotor rooter, nobody laughed. And then we went to a third place. <laughs> and the woman who hosted us said to me, uh, Dr. Jones clearly doesn't know in Australia, rotor rooter is slang for the F word. So what he oh said. <laughs> <laughs> 
to this day. I mean, this was 28 years ago. I t- every time I see him, I say, you went to Australia and insulted everybody <laughs> with your cultural insensitivity. And he's like the horror of his life because he's so anxious about that stuff. But you're right, man. Going back to, to uh, it's not just physicians. It's, it's you know, the, we're a world that... Um, the functional neuroimaging studies have shown we love confirmation of our biases. Right. If I ask you what football, you know, it takes a minute to figure out your body. Do you believe in God or not? What football team you pull for or what are your politics? I hook you up to neuroimaging. I give you information harmonious with your bias, your pleasure centers fire. Right. That's why we love to gossip about another person that neither of us likes is almost autoerotic. Our pleasures in this fire. But if you present information that is discordant with your bias, your pain centers fire. And and that and what tends to happen is you slay the messenger. Is I'm not interested in we we become a culture that does fundamental errors of attributions, we shrinks call it, which is when someone else acts in a way or espouses a belief that's outside my mental map about how things should be. I don't default to inquisitiveness, which is what resilient people do, resilient leaders, resilient parents, resilient friends. Wait, I know you behave in amazing sense. I'm just not understanding it. Let me understand. Talk to me about why you're thinking that. We don't jump to We jump to slaying the character of the other person. You're stupid, you're biased, you're bigoted, you're the, you're a bad person. I can't stand to watch ESPN anymore, man. All they do is scream at each other, making fundamental errors. Like, are you out of your mind? Of course that guy shouldn't be the MVP. The other, or you're just being ridiculous, you know. And, and so that's how we limit expansion of our knowledge base, whether it's in our marriages, in our work teams, or in in the the science, uh, whatever our science is, we've got to we've got to practice defaulting to inquisitiveness rather than I believe it this way because I was taught it this way and I do it this way because I've always done it this way. I've always found that having an open mind and um, you know, like I, I'm I'm infinitely curious of of everything. I, I've just always been before mentioned kayak. I I know nothing about wood. I wanted to do something with wood. I can tell you a thousand things. And one day I decided I wanted to learn how to rock climb. And before long, I was finding myself on, you know, hanging off the sides of, of <clears throat> thousand foot cliffs. You can't get there in life unless you're curious. Um, right. And one of the things people, and I hear this all the time because I'm on social media every day. I'm, um, um, I usually use um, um, Twitter and, and Instagram. Um, and of course, vegans hate me because I tell people to eat meat. <clears throat> right. And I'm, I would like some good discourse. But if they if they ask a question, a leading and I know it's a it's a leading question, I see it. I mean, you, you would have to be dumb not to see it for what it's worth. And I'll give them a, an answer. I won't call them dumb. I won't call them stupid. I won't say you look like crap. And then they will come back immediately with ad hominem. Right. So it's like, you're out of argument already. I'm, I'm trying to have yeah. discourse here. I'm trying to figure out where we are. <clears throat> and then I have to eventually block them when, when they just go down the road, because there's nothing positive to be learned here. If they want to talk and, and, and learn something or help me to learn something, I'm, I'm open ears. But yeah. when people yeah, go down, we, go on. That's how we expand. I, you know, it's, I, I know we have thinking about this. Um, Vinny, is growth, this is a, a Brene Brown a concept, growth only happens at the point of vulnerability. And so, well, vulnerability, that doesn't mean I'm a fall on the ground crying, but if I, if I say, hey, Vinny, wait a second, you said something I don't agree with, and I feel vulnerable just role-playing that because, you know, you might get angry with me. Or if you're open to it, you said you will feel some vulnerability. Now, wait a minute, somebody's going to, I don't know what I don't know. Somebody's going to point something out to me outside my my awareness of myself or or my understanding of what the topic is. We've got to be willing to hang in with that vulnerability and then deal with each other with 
emotional intelligence, you know, with a, a managing our own emotions, uh, whatever they might be about dealing with someone who disagrees with me, but also being respectful of the other person's emotions. Because if I, if I go in with rigidity, my defenses are up and it stirs your defenses, we're not going to communicate. And we're labeling each other in some barrier label ways. You know, you're you're bad in some way, as opposed to going in with curiosity. It limits the discourse and uh, it's a defense against our own vulnerability, that kind of rigidity. But man, it, it happens kind of par for the course in our world these days. Yeah. Well, look, and we're going further and further down this road. Um, for the first time, we've indicted um, a, a, one of the presidents of the United States, you know, former yeah. president. Uh, and by the way, we're we're recording this on a Wednesday, folks. This is coming out of not this Friday, but next. And who knows what's going to happen? And okay, so the guy's a Republican, and of course he's Trump, and and <clears throat> half the country hates him, and they're going, "Good, I'm glad this happened." And the other half of the country is going, "Wait a minute, you know." And I'm sitting there because I don't do politics. I don't do yeah, it on the show. Either. I don't talk about politics. I don't care about if you're on the right, I'm happy. If you're on the left, I'm happy. You know, I don't care. Um, mm -hmm. Politics don't, but I'm looking at it going, I'm not sure we went down the right road by indicting. Okay, maybe he did something wrong. I don't know. But, you know now it's in court. We're going to find out. But I'm not sure if that's a good precedence that we're setting because. What's going to happen? Biden's going to come out two years from now, and then they're going to start indicting him. And, you know, where do we stop? Where does this end? And is this good for the country is the way I look at it, right? Is it good for yeah. anybody? We well, you know globally, um, more and more what's happening, it seems to me, and I, I'm, listen, I'm with you, Ben. I am, I'm an independent. I, yeah. you know, I don't like politics. Uh, but it's a fascinating study of sociology when you in, in talking about a fundamental error of attribution. It's don't argue politics or religion with people. You don't change their mind about politics or religion. You change their mind about you right. because they, they conclude. And, and I do, you know, I find that to be the case. Worldwide, what's happening is more and more a questioning of unbridled, do what I want to do without consequences, whether it's uh, fake news or not. And uh, they, I, 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 heard a, I, I heard an interesting, David Letterman did it, has a series now where he does in-depth interviews with people on Netflix. And he had Barack Obama on, I don't know, sometime. He usually do celebrities. Uh, but Barack Obama said something interesting. Letterman said, do you think Trump is a threat to the, and what, what Obama says, I don't think th Trump, Trump, Trump's a threat. The threat to the well-being of the world is that you can get 24-7, whether you're on the right or the left, in the middle, no matter what it is you believe, you can get 24-7 confirmation of your bias. Right. You know, you, you can find the right podcast, the right webcast, the right Twitter account. You can find the right uh, cable news station. You can find whatever. And that perpetuates us, them, we, they ways of thinking. And that's what's dangerous. And so to your point, I think it is an interesting thing to observe. Is this a good thing or not? I don't know. Let's see. Do we need a correction factor from uh, people who are not held accountable uh, maybe so. Is this the right correction factor? I don't know. It's a hell of a time we live in, then, though, buddy. I tell you, the um, one of the things I, I rail against all the time, and it's one of my pet peeves, is <clears throat> this device right here, cell phone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, keeps marriage I, and family. It keeps marriage and family uh, therapists in business in that yeah. device. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I've, I've had. Um, no shortage of doctors because I'm trying to figure out what's going on. This is going to, you know, online, Wayne, you don't know this, but they call me Gran Torino online. Um, I sound like the old man that's yelling, get off my lawn. <clears throat> and rightly so. But I'm legitimately worried about the young generation. And I remember the first time, and I'll tell, I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. Uh, my wife um, is an actress and um, she was, um, we were still living in LA. And she decided to do a play. And when you do a play, you have to go to play practice a lot, which is a problem when you're an old school Italian and you expect the meal to show up on the table. <laughs> so I was on my own. And by the way, your dad will love this. I learned how to cook meatballs really well. And, <laughs> uh, 
I got tired of meatballs after a couple of weeks and hamburgers <laughs> and the whole thing night after night. But there was this place right down the street. It, it, I could walk from my house and it was a Friday night and I do a lot of work for my phone. So I said, you know, I'm gonna bring my phone. I'm gonna get all my social media done. So in order not to look like a loser sitting at a table, I sat at the bar because they'll give you the full menu at the bar <laughs> and um, ordered what I wanted. And I'm sitting there and I'm doing all my social media. And about 20 minutes later, I'm done and I'm eating my food. And when I was done, I didn't want to go back home yet. I wasn't, I wasn't done being out because I'm in the house. You're looking at my office mm -hmm. here, Wayne, and I'm in, I'm in the office all the time. I, I don't want to go back home. I'm going to just go get in front of the computer and work some more. So I, I ordered a cocktail and I'm, I'm drinking and, uh, and I'll look around the bar Friday night and man, there are a lot of good looking women and there are a lot of good looking men. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, man, if I was of age, if I was of age, boy, I would, I would be hitting on that one and this one and the other one over here. And then I started noticing not one guy was walking up to any of these young women. They were all my stepdaughter's age. Not one guy was, and I'm like, wait a minute. They have all the vaginas. <laughs> they need to, they need to figure out back in my day, you would jump through every hoop to get a girl. <laughs> oh, would you like to dance? Would you like a drink? Would you like something? Please talk to me, lady. I'll buy interact. You, you would you. interact with them, right? Nobody was talking. I was perplexed. I came back. I talked about this on my podcast. And I said, I, I couldn't understand it. Really good looking women, really good looking men. Nobody was talking. They were hurting. The women were hurting. And then people wrote to me and they said, oh, Vin, you don't understand. They were talking through this device. It's amazing. Yeah. They, they don't have the, the wherewithal to, to, they can't stand the rejection. So there's these things, and I've never actually been to them. You know what you think? You can swipe right or swipe left. And yeah. like, oh, yeah. if you say, is someone in my area Yes, I'm, in, I'm within 10 feet of you, and you start swiping. They can't handle the face-to-face -face rejection of a woman saying, oh, no, I'm good with my drink, or get out of here, creep, or whatever. That was the beginning of me thinking that this is ruining everyone's life. The, and, and then about a month later was when, I don't know if you remember this, out in Woodland Hills, California, about five miles from that, that night, that low eatery, there was a guy that went in and shot up the place, killed a bunch of people. It was horrible. Yeah. And it, you know, it scared me because when my daughter was home from college, that's where her and her friends would go. She could have easily oh, been there on any given night. She right? is terrible. So I'm looking well, at- I think there's no, there's no question that what, that our devices have changed psychosocial developmental um, processes. There's no question about this. You know, and I don't want to sound like an old fort either, but um, the, the former American uh, Surgeon General of America adopted his platform that a, uh, on par with smoking 15 cigarettes a day is the loneliness. We have a loneliness epidemic, and particularly it starts in young, in early adolescence, and it's because kids or not socializing more. They're doing things on their devices. Is is right. is one of the reasons. Um, we in my work, one of the things I talk about is if you want to, if you want to sustain your resilience, you got to hone your ear, E A R. You got to manage energy, attitude, and relationships. And one of the biggest energy drainers is we've institution, we normalize it. We wake up before we get out of bed, we get that device and start doom scrolling. Everything right. you focus on, you either make a deposit or withdrawal from your energy, your bio, psycho, social, spiritual energy. It's like in a big tank inside. You think a thought, you made a deposit withdrawal. You take a sip of this, you take a withdrawal. You take a sip of that, you make a, a deposit. Well, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. Because a lot of times that doom scrolling is like you wake up. And before you're fully awake, you open the door to your, your house or your apartment. You let every idiot who's pissed off about anything in the world in your house to scream at you all morning while you're trying to get ready to get, you know, get ready for your day. That's not what elite performers do. Elite performers are very selective about what influences they expose themselves to. So 
I've got real concerns about the whole thing about the uh, technology and its effect on people's psychosocial and psychosexual development. I mean, only I say, you know, again, not to sound like an, an old fart, but what does it do? What kind of, you know, we used to go steal <laughs> a Playboy from the local drugstore yeah. to look at. I mean, what happens these days, kids starting 8, 10, 11 years old can get online and watch the most explicit porn in the world imaginable. Yeah. It shapes their expectations about what's supposed to happen when they start interacting sexually. And none of us live up to that kind of stuff. Right. You know, the development is, is hard enough without having um, exposure to the, 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 these constant uh, drainers of our self-esteem or shapers of unrealistic expectations or, or impediments to our social connecting. Uh, you know, I was out in L.A. You know, because my company uh, is still out in L.A., so I have to be out there once a month or so. And uh, I was just there last week, and I was in the gym in L.A., the same gym I, I, I would go to. And I'm looking around, and in between every set, every kid is, as a matter of fact, they're not even working out anymore. They Someone said, hey, you need to get out of my basement and go to the- They sit on the damn machine. They sit on the machine and, and do their <laughs> scroll. Right. <laughs> it, it, look, I, I'm going to show you something. I, I don't just work out in the gym behind me. I was in the gym today. This is going to go up on my Instagram. I want to show this to you, Wayne. I'm going to see. Tell me if you can see this in the camera. I'm going to have to kind of hold it sideways. Yeah, I see it. I see, see a it. guy. All right. So I'm going to play this for you. It's only a five second video, but this is common. Like, all right. So I'm going to tell you what he's on a, a, a curl machine. His head is actually on his head is actually on the pad where your arms are supposed to do the, the arm curls, right? Gotcha. Um, and I was able to see this. I watched it for about three minutes. I did a couple of sets. I walked over to the little cubby where my phone was, was able to get my phone and take this six second video. So this guy was like this for about five minutes. And he actually moved for the first time while I was taking this video. Of course, I did it from behind because I didn't want to embarrass the guy because I'm going to put this online. But look at this. That's amazing. It's not considered a workout. So when he moved, he just moved his head and kept looking at the phone. And I would like to say that he was one of one in that gym that day. This is common. They can't do a set. I saw a guy a couple of weeks ago. This was my favorite. Um, he he couldn't. He was looking at the phone. He couldn't let go up. Now you see on my hand. I have big hands, but my hand cannot go around the phone. Right. He was trying to change a bar on you know with a carabiner, and he was trying to do it with his hands because <laughs> he couldn't let. He couldn't think of putting the phone down for a second. <laughs> and I I I said God, I wish I could get to my cubby and get my phone and bring it back here to because. No one's going to ever believe that this yeah, right. <laughs> the guy wrestled with it for about a minute. And a minute is a long time. You do speeches. A minute is an attorney. Yeah, it's a long and time, right? He just kept trying to do this. And it's like, he hasn't considered letting go of the security blanket of this. It's amazing. It, it, to me, that's worse than the guy who's death scrolling for five minutes on a curl machine. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's that much of a thing. I actually have one of the experts that studied what happened at Columbine, you know, with those kids. Yeah. And she's been on the show a couple of times. Dr. Lisa uh, Stroman has been on the show a couple of times and um, she worked for the government. They were, you know, psychologists, they were trying to figure out, you know, what happened. I mean, all the signs were there for Columbine. Right. And this is before wow. cell phones. Right. And everyone thought these kids were perfectly normal. Right, they didn't see a problem until there was a problem, okay. and we so, could we could do this over and over and over again. It just never ends, right? So yeah, yeah. the question is, when you know, because look, every time it happens, if you turn on the news, they're gonna the first thing you're gonna hear is AR-15, even if mm -hmm. they didn't use an AR-15. It's just become this weird throw word of uh, AR-15s. Got to get rid of AR-15s. Okay, great. You might be right. I don't know. Good luck getting over 400 million guns out of this country tomorrow. Good luck on that. But yeah. is there another problem? Because when I was a kid at Ascension Catholic, during hunting season, a lot of us brought shotguns to school. 
and they, I know at least in my truck, it was left in the back of the truck, hanging in the thing. Right. And my truck, the doors didn't lock, right? No one ever considered walking to that truck and coming in and blowing away a classroom right. in 1979, 1978. Right. No one. Yet today, this is what's going on. And the reason we brought guns to school, folks, is there was a levee right on the other side of the church and <laughs> we couldn't get home fast enough and get back before it got dark during the winter months. <laughs> so if you right. wanted to, if you wanted to get a couple of rabbits after football practice, <laughs> we would try to scare <laughs> a, couple a, of rabbits. a small window of time. Right. Yeah. You, you had about 45 minutes of hunting and we were all obsessed with hunting. Yeah. Um, so that that's what we would do. Um, yet, now, it, you know, there's no way in hell you're bringing a shotgun to school. No, right. you but when not. you say that to people, they go, Connor, you're making that up. And I've had people corroborate that story. I've had other kids I played ball with and whatever. Oh, yeah, we all did. Especially on sat on Saturday practice after a Friday night game, all the kids from Vashery, we, we would do a thing. And we would bring the dogs out and everything. Right? Right. That was just a thing. You can't sure. do that anymore. No, it's, that's right. live in a different world. It's a very different world. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, Wayne, I don't want to keep you forever. You, you've been... It's been a pleasure, buddy. It more really more than gracious to come on and talk about this stuff. And I would love to have you back at some point. Anytime. So are you living in Charlottesville now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we moved to Charlottesville right before the pandemic happened. What a beautiful place, man. Really yeah. Beautiful. And, well, you're in a great place, too. I mean, uh, I'm going to yeah. be heading right through your area tomorrow. I'm, I'm heading down to Donaldsonville tomorrow. I'm driving through there. Are you really? I'm yeah, yeah. I, I, I drive home. I, I, my dad doesn't know I'm coming, but this podcast isn't coming out until next week. So I'm, I'm going oh, to surprise Cy with, with a little, uh, you know hang out down there for a couple of days that's yeah. fabulous man will you really really and truly tell him tell him hey for me my sister tony says she ran into your dad at church or somewhere and he said with tears in his eyes man i think about all those days of us playing music i mean your dad was really i what i said to you i meant your dad and your mom were always just incredibly kind and sweet and affirming to me um, as I think they were to, to many, many people, but it meant a bunch to me. And, and I wasn't particularly needy. I mean, I grew up in a family full of kind and sweet and affirming people, but it, they they stood out in, 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 they stand out in my memory. I spent a lot of time with your dad um, yeah. and it was 100% pleasant time. He was always just a positive laughing, telling stories in, in, in enjoyable guys. So please give them my love and tell them I still think about them each. Uh, I certainly will. Uh, hang on just a second. I want to say goodbye to you off the air, folks. Um, I had so much fun talking to Wayne. I left every ad out of the show, but I have to do this by contract. Villa Capelli <laughs> olive oil is the best olive oil on the planet. That's not just me saying that. Listen, in this country, we're able to cut olive oil up to 40% and still call it 100% pure olive oil. That's BS. That doesn't happen with Villa Capelli. The stuff comes from Puya. Uh, you will love it. Anna is there right now at the Villa Capelli property in Puya. And um, God, she's coming back, I think, tomorrow. So Anna's enjoying all the Villa Capelli she can. I'm sure she's like diving into vats of it right now, folks. You ask me all the time when we do the consults, is it really that good? Don't take it from me. Go get it yourself. Villa Capelli, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, will save you 10%. If you spend more than $125 after the discount, you will also get free shipping from Villa Capelli. Uh, also at my company, purecoffeeclub.com. Um, for this month only, this is April. This is the month of April, 2023. So if you hear this podcast in five years, this deal won't be there. You could get my coffee. That's right. I'm the guy who came up with the roast, roasted them all on my front porch, figured them out, and they're out there. Uh, go check it out, purecoffeeclub.com. Right now, we have a promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, and you will get 15% uh, off. I try, Look, folks, I can't do 20% like we do with the vitamins and the um, foods because there's just not that much markup in coffee. It would be like, Wayne's dad with the meatballs. Uh, you guys <laughs> were going to be broke. So 15% uh, 
at purecoffeeclub.com for this month only. Don't call me on, on May 1st and go, hey, man, I missed out. No, I can't help you. Get it now. Come on. All right. Uh, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Wayne's got somewhere between 10 and 12 books on Amazon. Uh, they will all be in the Vinny Book Club. So you can go check them out there. Megan, get all those books in my book club. Uh, go check them out. <laughs> and um, you um, you can, you know, click the red banner. You put a little coal on the fire. You get my train down the track.